Okay, good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Let's pray and get into this morning's class. Uh, could one of us go ahead and lead, please? Father, we thank you for this wonderful time. Thank you for this opportunity to be here, Lord. And we submitted this class into your hand, Lord Jesus. We are going to learn your word. Father, help us to learn more and help us give us wisdom, knowledge to understand, Father. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's get back to Acts chapter 11 and quickly summarize some of the events that took place in Acts 11. This is right after Peter ministers in the house of Cornelius and uh, uh, the news goes up to Jerusalem. We saw how the Jews in Jerusalem were questioning what Peter had done, but Peter explained and he said that it was because of the way God led him as well as Cornelius. So he narrates the entire story and he tells them that it was God who sent him to uh, minister to the Gentiles. And finally, in verse 18 of Acts 11, when people heard, the Jewish leaders heard this, uh, it says that they became silent and they glorified God. So that's a good thing because uh, what's happening is that even though God is doing something new, the leaders are making sure that they maintain unity among themselves because Peter could have said that I'm doing it. So what? If you don't agree with me, it doesn't matter. But he did not have that kind of an attitude. He made sure that he explained himself and also thank God that God worked in their hearts and they heard Peter out. They were silent. They glorified God. And uh, it says then God, they said that God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance of repentance to life. So they all rejoiced together. The person who did the ministry and all the leadership connected to him. So praise God. There was a lot of unity uh, among the leadership. Then we saw the next uh, section of uh, Acts 11 where because of persecution, uh, particularly what we saw happening in the times of Stephen and Stephen was martyred. Uh, there were believers who were scattered across the region. So there were certain believers from Cyprus and Cyrene who planted churches. Um, uh, uh, they planted a church in Syria, uh, the city of Antioch. And over here, there was a good work of God that was going on. Uh, the wonderful thing, uh, uh, the verse that, you know, I uh, sort of comes back to me is verse 21, where it says, and the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So the, the church, a church is God's work. Remember, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So in the same way, uh, we see that though the people are doing the work of the ministry, who is at work? Ultimately, God is at work. If God is not working in our church, the church cannot grow. And that's a beautiful reminder for us in verse 21. It says, the hand of the Lord was with them. So God was with them. Uh, and God's uh, power, his working was with them. No wonder there was a great number uh, that believed and they turned to the Lord. So people were coming to God. The church was growing. And in these times, uh, if you recall, we said that the Church of Jerusalem was overseeing the new churches uh, and uh, they, they carried that apostolic authority and that apostolic function. So they made sure that the new churches that are rising up are thoroughly equipped. So when this news came to the ears of Jerusalem, that only tells us that people were reporting constantly to the leadership of Jerusalem, you know, about what is happening in the ministry. So the news goes to Jerusalem. And just the way, uh, you know, they sent Philip to Samaria, this time around they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So Barnabas comes here and he's so encouraged to see uh, what, was God, what God was doing among these people. And we also said that Barnabas was a good man. So we talked about uh, good people in leadership over the church, which is a blessing to the church. Uh, and a very crucial step that Barnabas takes is to go and invite Saul to come and partner with him in the ministry. So uh, they, uh, 
Saul comes, Barnabas, Barnabas and him, they spent time there a whole year. It says they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. So thorough equipping, thorough equipping of the church. We said that they could have taught them the apostles' doctrine, uh, which included the scriptures that Jesus believed in, as well as the teachings of our Lord Jesus and uh, certainly regarding the life, the ministry, um, the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thorough equipping of the believers was taking place. And what were the Christians called for the first time in Antioch? Yeah, I only said of Christians. So the believers uh, were called as Christians. So up until now, they are not called as Christians. They're not identified as Christians. So it is said that Christian um, means little Christ. So as Jesus was, these people are like him. That's why they're called as Christians. Uh, and uh, thank God people could see that the believers, the disciples are following Jesus. That is what is important uh, in our walk with the Lord. Are we truly following Christ? And because they were following, they got the name as Christians. Then what happened? This church of Antioch is thriving. Uh, there is a, 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 what do you call, a, a ministry that is taking place. So far we saw teaching ministry. But right now there are a set of prophets who are also sent from uh, Jerusalem. They come and minister in Antioch. And at that time, there is a notable prophet by the name of Agabus. And Agabus releases a prophetic word which says that there is going to be a worldwide famine. And in response to this famine, the church of Antioch decides that they want to send relief to the church, all the brethren in Judea. <coughs> so they... Um, start to give. How do they give? Uh, are they forced by the leaders? No. They are. They determined to give each one according to his own ability. So this much we saw. Now let us see what happens from here. We'll move on to Acts chapter 12. So while the church of Antioch is thriving, uh, we'll come back to the church of Antioch shortly. The scene shifts to the persecution that prevails. Now, how did uh, the church of Antioch come about? Obviously through persecution because people were scattered and the believers began to minister in uh, Antioch. Now, persecution was peaking around this time. It's always been high, uh, but you know, Luke for some reason wants to bring our attention to the kind of persecution that was taking place. So Acts chapter 12 is about persecution. It's about God's intervention during a time of persecution. So we begin by reading about the death of one of the apostles. So from Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 4, we notice that Herod, he kills James, who's one of the leaders of the church. Let's remember, there are two James among the apostles. One is James, the brother of John, and James, the brother of Jesus. So James, the brother of Jesus, is the one whom we are going to see emerge as the leader of the church, like the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Okay, Soon we are going to see James is the one. When we come to Acts 15, he's the one leading the council. He's the one you know, facilitating the decision uh, in the Jerusalem council. But right now, there is another James, who is again the brother of John, who is killed, who is killed. So persecution, what's happening? Earlier, they were targeting the believers. Stephen died. Now they've come straight to the apostles. So they've killed James. This surely must have been a very painful, a very um, like an intimidating or it, it would have shaken up the people. Yes or no? 
because Herod targets one of the leaders. He's harassing the church. It says the King Herod stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Once Herod did this, now who is this Herod? That is also something that we want to uh, understand. When we say Herod, uh, it's not one particular person. This name Herod was shared by a couple of people. If we go back, it's like a surname. So if we go back in time, at the time when Jesus was born, there was Herod the Great. Okay, So he is like the grandfather of this Herod that we're talking about. And then you had uh, Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the person who beheaded John the Baptist. So he, he was one of those people. Now Herod Agrippa I is the one who is mentioned in Acts chapter 12. And he is the one who has killed James. Right? So they seem to be uh, a family of persecutors. So it's pretty dangerous dealing with these people. Uh, and uh, why were they persecuting? They could have had their own reasons. But the reason why Herod Agrippa is persecuting James is because the people were happy. When he killed James, uh, as a leader, as a king, there was a good response. You know, sometimes that's what leaders look for. They look for uh, public acceptance. They look for uh, glory. They look for uh, um, people, people congratulating them, applauding them for the good work. So when James was killed, the people were happy. They were pleased, the Bible says. The Jews were pleased. And so he thought about it. He said, uh, why can't I Why can't I continue to gain the favor of the Jews? So what did he do next? We see that he sees Peter also. Because he would have heard of this name, Peter. Oh, that main person. What if I kill Peter? The Jews will be even more happy. So he seizes Peter. And what he does is he puts Peter inside the prison. He's not able to kill Peter. Why? What is the reason? The reason is those days were the days of the unleavened bread. And it was uh, not acceptable to kill a prisoner at that time. So he knew that right now he cannot kill. Let him just keep Peter in the prison. And when there is the perfect time, he can kill Peter. So how was Peter positioned in the prison? You know, literally like a, a very very, you know, uh, hardcore criminal, like that he was treated. Why do we say that? Because look at the description in verse 4. It says, when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So what is this? Four squads of prison, uh, four squads of soldiers. If you calculate it, uh, it is said that there were four squads, a total of 18 soldiers who would do a six hour duty. So they'll take turns like a roster and do uh, six hour duties. As well as Peter was chained and bound. Now think about this. The man is already chained. Why do you need 18 soldiers to watch this person unless he is some major disruptive criminal. But that's the way Peter was treated. Don't know how he felt. We don't know how the church felt at that time. But they were going through a very hard time where the leaders of the church were now under, um, the, under threat. And uh, Peter is in the prison. Thank God. The timing was such that Herod did not decide to kill him. He said, okay, let's wait. Let's let the days of the unleavened bread be completed. Then next person to die is Peter. So in these circumstances, what do you think we can do when such things happen? We can pray. Yeah, what else can we do? Yeah, fasting and prayer. Okay, what else can we do? Yeah, great. That's true. 
yeah yeah true you know uh, there are circumstances where we don't even know what to do anymore like what can we do now how do we reach out uh, uh, to the government we don't know what and all they thought and uh, all they could think of was prayer sometimes the answer is three answers right so they say it like that three answers prayer 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 nothing else there is no option we have to pray we have to pray god has to help us there is no way out so the church is in that situation and they are praying before the lord so verse 5 says peter was therefore kept in prison but constant prayer was offered to god for him by the church thank god the church or the early church was a praying church from the beginning that's what we are hearing praying 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 now because they were praying so much god was able to release his power in their midst okay it's a huge lesson for us if we are a praying church god can move in our midst but if we are not a praying church god even if he wishes to there are limitations that we put on um, you know the work of god so prayer constant prayer earnest prayer this word constant prayer uh, it's translated as earnest prayer fervent prayer like you know the what james says later on the earnest prayer of a righteous man avails much and this kind of prayer is the kind of prayer we are told jesus was engaged in in the garden of gethsemane jesus prayed earnestly the bible says in luke 22 verse 44 okay so in a troubled time he gave us that example he was also in trouble he was going now to be crucified what did jesus teach us to do earnest prayer he also prayed they are in trouble what to do pray earnest prayer constant prayer and so that is what the church family decided to do thank god and they went before the lord and they are praying so we can imagine you, you remember we said they were praying in the temple earlier they were worshiping in the temple they were worshiping house to house so we can also imagine that people were all gathering here there everywhere getting together and saying lord you deliver our leader you deliver peter james is already gone but we don't want peter to die so sometimes when we look at the world around us and the climate of persecution that prevails over various regions uh, i i know some uh, of you who are here in class also your own regions you've seen it first hand uh, persecution happens but prayer is the answer right so let's uh, encourage that so the church is praying now it says when herod was about to bring him out that night peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison so it's basically a narration of the night before herod is planning to bring him out so what happened peter is still in safe custody and look at this peter was sleeping if you and i are in a prison right with 18 soldiers watching us any day they can bring us out any day just now james was killed it can be my turn can we sleep <laughs> sleep won't come <laughs> but peter was sleeping how we don't understand peter was sleeping and he was still bound kids there are chains uh, soldiers guards then something happens you see when the church is praying god knows how to deliver god knows how to deliver his people that's what the bible says so what is god doing now he's sending an angel supernatural if a person cannot enter that place how about an angel goes into the prison so the angel of the lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison and he struck peter on the side and raised him up saying arise quickly 
and his chains fell off his hands. So deliverance came to Peter by the hands of an angel. What encouragement. Even if a human being is not able to reach us in our, uh, uh, you know, in, in our distress, God is even able to send an angel. God sent an angel for Peter. But this could only happen because the church was praying. Okay? And the chains fall off of Peter. And the angel is telling him, arise quickly, escape. It's time to escape, Peter. And the angel tells him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he's doing everything. Put on your garments and follow me. Peter is doing everything. Verse 9. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Okay, so it's all happening right now. The angel is leading him out of the prison. Okay, and for Peter, it's still not settled in his mind. He's thinking, am I, is this a dream? Like, is this a vision? Like, what's happening? There's an angel leading me out of the prison. It's amazing. How does God lead us through specifics? You recall, at the time of Ananias, go to street, uh, you know, street, straight, exact address. At the time of going and meeting Simon Peter in Simon the Tanner's house, those men know. They go to that house and they bring Peter. So what's happening is God knows all things and he, he has put an angel in that place to very specifically in a detailed way lead out Peter. So he comes out and uh, notice again it will be like a proper direction. So from verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard post. They came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. So basically, the angel is moving towards one address. That's where the angel is leading Peter. Whose address is this this time? That's the question. Whose address? Where are they? Where are we going? Where should we go now that we are released from the prison? And what does Peter say to himself? Now finally, Peter is coming to his senses. And he's saying, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So... God delivered Peter and it's only now when he's reaching that uh, address that he realizes. Now whose address is this? That was the address of a lady by the name of Mary whose son is called Mark. Who is this Mark? Very important personality. We are going to study about Mark later on uh, uh, in the missionary journeys of uh, Paul. But for now, remember, they came to Mark's house. Mark is the son of Mary. And what's happening in that house? Prayer is being offered. Okay. Prayer is being offered in that house. In verse 12, it says, Many were gathered together praying. How? What time was it? Late into the night. It's late into the night. And the church is still praying. That shows the fervency of prayer. That they carried. And when Peter comes there, the passage also tells us that there was a girl who goes to open the door. So her name is Rhoda. She goes to the door, she opens, and she's amazed. She's not able to say anything when she sees Peter. And she goes back inside and uh, tells them, tells the people, you know what? Peter is there. Peter is there at, at the door. Right? So she indicates. Uh, she actually doesn't tell them, but uh, one second. Did she tell them or not? Girl named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice. Huh. She told them. She told them. But the funny part is they don't believe her. 
They say, are you crazy? How can it be Peter? Because Peter is in the prison, right? It could be uh, Peter's angel. So those days in the Jewish tradition, they had this concept of every person has an angel. It's like a traditional thing. And so when Rhoda said that Peter has come, they said, no, Rhoda, it cannot be Peter. It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking on the door. When they came and saw him, they were astonished. They were amazed. That's what they were praying for. But when the answer came, their hearts are still not ready to receive it, that God actually did a miracle. But anyway, thank God. They accepted Peter. Uh, and, uh, you know, Peter, finally, once he came in and met the people, he tells them, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. So the leader of the church, remember we, we told that uh, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, takes up leadership of the church. Why is Peter reporting to James? Because James is the official pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Okay, he's one of the apostles, yes, but he's also the one who is uh, uh, given the authority to oversee the church of Jerusalem. So he tells the people, please go and inform James. So even Peter, he's so accountable to the leadership. He tells them. Uh, and then what happens after that? You know, there was a lot of uh, uh, disturbance because overnight, a very important prisoner has escaped. Herod searched for him and he did not find him. He examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. Okay, And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So usually what happened those days was if the guards or the soldiers let a prisoner escape, there was only one conclusion. Kill the soldier. That's it. Very brutal. So Herod looked. He didn't find. He said, okay, bring all those soldiers. Kill them. That's it. How could you let this man, Peter, escape? That was his way of treating uh, the soldiers. And uh, they died. Right? Now, what is going to happen after this? We're going to see uh, the way Herod exalts himself. Okay, Very, uh, very... I don't know what word to use, but uh, a very different situation in the midst of uh, all that's going on. So persecution is there and uh, Herod is like this exalted ruler. And now he's going to uh, a place, right? Can we quickly read up uh, Acts 12 verse 20? Anyone? Just 20, you read 20. Okay. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord and having made blessed the king's chamber, chamberlain, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So I got a little confused um, whether it was uh, Peter who went to Caesarea or Herod who went to Caesarea. But it is Herod who went from Judea to Caesarea and uh, he was upset with uh, a, a set of people from uh, Tyre and Sidon. And uh, they came to him with one accord and uh, having made blasters the king's personal aid their friend they asked for peace so there are people who are asking for peace he was upset with them but now they're asking for peace and what herod does is he kind of addresses a public gathering okay and let's see the attitude that herod carries now this is the unusual thing that i i mentioned to us about so now you can read from verse 21 to 23 So on a set day, Herod arrived in royal apparel, apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. 
then immediately an angel of the lord struck him because he did not give glory to god and he was eaten by worms and died yes so here he is in caesarea and uh, um there is a group of people who are trying to make peace with herod and at that time he is addressing the crowd but what is the attitude that this king carries one of pride which is quite obvious because it says he was arrayed in a royal apparel which means um you know king's clothes he was arrayed in grand majestic clothes of the king sat on the throne and he is speaking he is speaking to the people uh, and the people are shouting they are they are uh, praising the king and they say that this is not a man you know it's the voice of god so sometimes people also tend to do that they try to exalt the human being above god so there's a lot of pride being displayed first of all um, the the king is displaying that pride plus the people are also joining hand in hand with what is going on but in that moment of pride god's judgment strikes herod okay very scary it says an angel of the lord struck him because he did not give glory to god and he was eaten by worms and died so when pride comes in we all know pride goes before a fall we know that god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble so even if in this life we uh, have many things to boast about we must never forget to give glory to god herod forgot to give glory to god he thought that you know he he knows everything he has everything he is mighty but when pride filled his heart it's something god hates you know a pride proud look the bible says god hates it and when pride was filled in herod's heart he was struck by an angel and we see later on that he was eaten by worms and he died so god's judgment hit the leader who was propagating the persecution in those times and after this incident took place the church had some peace we can say because you know he was one of the main persecutors right now and uh, thank god peter's life was spared if herod would have been alive who knows he would have sent the soldiers looking for peter and they would have caught him once again but for now it's an escape peter has escaped herod is dead what happens to the church in this situation look at the church huh? from that time till now it's only growing verse 24 but the word of god grew and multiplied in other words the word was being taught the people were being blessed the church was thriving the church was growing the church was well established so uh, no matter what the situation true to the word of god as jesus said i will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it the work of god is continuing and finally this last verse here where uh, uh, we are told that barnabas and saul returned from jerusalem why did they go to jerusalem relief remember relief money it was sent through the hands of the leaders so they give and they come back that's what it means then they came back from jerusalem they had fulfilled their ministry and they also took with them john whose surname was mark so now they are taking with them from jerusalem this remember the house where the prayer was going on the prayer meeting mark so they take mark along who becomes a team member so this is acts 12 uh, let's go ahead and discuss if there are any questions so my question is like uh, so apostles are doing the work of god uh-huh. and like which the money they are getting they are giving to the uh, jerusalem right uh not like that actually okay so in this case they are giving the money because uh, the prophet agabus he prophesied saying there is going to be a famine 
so they collected some money and they gave it as relief help help it's not uh, uh, it's not like uh, all the money is being directed to jerusalem it's not like that got it yeah so sure. any other thoughts anything okay it's fairly simple the things that have taken place in this chapter so if there are no questions we can uh, end here i would request please read and come two chapters at a time so now that we completed 12 you can read through just quickly read through it'll hardly take you 10 minutes chapter 13 chapter 14 and then we'll go ahead and explain them in the next class yeah so okay let's pray let's pray and close Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father God, for a reminder of how faithful you are, how true, Lord, um, Lord, as you called Peter, even though he was in this difficult situation, you delivered him. You are the Lord, our deliverer. Help us, Lord, to always remember that when we are doing your work, Lord, you will deliver us, even if it takes uh, a supernatural means to do it, Father God. And Lord. we thank you uh, that you are faithful to your church the church is always growing the word of god is always thriving oh god and father god it's so encouraging uh, to see that and lord as each one of us do the work of ministry um, the way you've called us help us lord to have faith that uh, you will increase oh god the the work of God in and through our lives, uh, Father God, thank you once again for what we have learned this morning. Uh, we commit the rest of the day, the rest of the week into your hands. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. God bless.